Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Sleep apnea. Most of us have heard of it, and that's because it's fairly common. Mm -hmm. It's estimated that there are about 20 million Americans who suffer from sleep apnea, and a lot of those people don't even know they have it. They're sound asleep. (laughs) Sleep apnea can affect people of any age, even infants and children. But it's most often seen in people over the age of 40, men, especially those who are obese or overweight. But what is it? It's when you're sleeping and your breathing stops and starts, and that happens multiple times during the night. There are lots of reasons to learn more about it, one of which is the fact that it can have all kinds of adverse health consequences. We better talk to a Mayo Clinic expert about it. To learn how you find out if you have it and to learn about treatment, including a new treatment for one type of sleep apnea. Joining us in studio from the Mayo Clinic Sleep Center is Dr. Timothy Morgenthaler. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Morgenthaler. Oh, thank you for having me. Dr. Morgenthaler, nice to have you. So sleep apnea, most of us have heard of it or know somebody who has it, but it's actually a little more complex than most of us think because there's more than one type. Than just snoring. Yeah. yeah, no, that's so true. So, you know, I think many people have been hearing about sleep apnea over the years. It is a disorder that's become more common as the population ages. And unfortunately, as many of us get heavier, uh, obstructive sleep apnea in particular is the most common kind of sleep apnea out there. And as you mentioned, this is uh, something that happens as we all fall asleep, our muscles relax. And when those muscles in the back of the throat relax, there's a tendency to narrow the airway. And in some people, it just completely obstructs. When it's almost obstructed, it gets very noisy and and many of us will start snoring. And if it just goes a little farther, then all of a sudden, although someone's trying very hard to breathe while they're sleeping, it's really not a successful effort because the upper airway is closed. So that's, that's really what's behind obstructive sleep apnea. And as you mentioned, boy, it's, it's quite prevalent. 20 to 30 million Americans have it. And and the prevalence overall or how common it is in the population goes up as we get older. And, and how many of those people have actually sought help? I mean, how many do we know about? You know, uh, the, the best estimates that are maybe as many as 20% have actually sought out help and been diagnosed and are treated. And so that leaves like 80% of the people out there that are struggling with this disorder and may not even know it. Uh, really? It's really a shame that they don't know about it because there are some very significant consequences to having untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Um, you know, one of them that's sort of the most obvious is that if while you're sleeping, you actually are just struggling to breathe and getting woken up again and again, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 times per hour, it, it is fairly apparent that that's going to interrupt the quality of your sleep. But the person doesn't realize that they're being woken up, right? Exactly. Very often the, the patient themselves that has the sleep apnea is not aware. They might be aware and oftentimes they'll complain, gee, I you know I go to bed tired either I don't sleep so well as I used to, or I wake up thinking that I slept well and I'm really not well rested. And that, so that's one of the main consequences. One of the main consequences of obstructive sleep apnea is that people are sleeping. They have a significantly higher risk of automobile accidents and falling asleep during meetings and professional perfor- performance. But in addition to that, these repetitive pauses in their breathing are associated with a lot of stress on the heart and the brain. And so we know that people with obstructive sleep apnea have increased problems with depression and insomnia complaints, uh, decreased libido, their social interactions aren't as good. It can also cause a lot of problems with uh, uh, vascular complications, actually. They have a higher likelihood to develop high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, heart rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation. So these all get quite serious and should get people's attention and are good reasons to seek out help if you might be one of those that have obstructive sleep apnea. Is it the 20% of people who do come and get help, the 80% of people just think it's snoring. It's not my problem. I'm asleep. It's everybody else in the house's problem. I, I, th- that is, I think that is true. Very often when I see patients, you know, they'll sort of say, well, my wife says that I snore. And I often will say that, well, is your wife prone to uh, lying? Or, you know, <laughs> but, but I think there is a, an issue of people aren't just always aware that snoring is not necessarily innocent. And all sleep is not restful sleep. Exactly, exactly true. And and so, you know, when you know, when should somebody suspect that they might have obstructive sleep apnea? They or their bed partner will say. Um, well, I think you know we've been talking about snoring a lot. That's just a marker for airway narrowing, uh, poorly restorative sleep. So you're waking up, you're not really feeling well rested, even though you're, you know, providing an adequate amount of sleep. Or if uh, your bed partner is watching you stop breathing multiple times, that you know, these are all signs that you, you really could be having problems with some form of sleep apnea, and the most common being obstructive. But but I think you were asking me actually about other kinds of That's sleep right. apnea. Right. So right. I, I, obstructive I, is by far the most common. It right? is, it is. 
but then there's there's really a, a smaller group of individuals that have a different kind of sleep apnea. Maybe five percent of everybody out there with sleep apnea, five to five to fifteen percent have a kind of sleep apnea that we call central sleep apnea. Now, what's what's the difference? Remember, in obstructive sleep apnea, the the person who has this is trying to breathe, but they can't because their upper airway is obstructed. That's where the obstructive comes from. People with central sleep apnea, the problem is that the brain is intermittently not sending the signal to take those breaths. And so why would that happen? Well, this is going to happen in people who either have a problem with their brain um, or there's a problem with their heart. And so the signals are getting a little crossed during the time when their their body is deciding whether or not to breathe. So the the risk factors for central sleep apnea really are uh, for a person who has heart disease, especially heart failure, or who've had strokes or who have uh, fluid overload, like uh, somebody who has uh, in, you know, insufficiently treated kidney disease. And then interestingly enough, another group of people who have central sleep apnea or have a higher risk for central sleep apnea are people who are on chronic uh, narcotic pain medications. Uh, hmm. the, the narcotics uh, tend to affect breathing in, in a way that's somewhat unpredictable. And so in, in these individuals, they, they may have some of the same symptoms as obstructive sleep apnea, or they may not. They may actually just kind of say, I don't sleep so well, I don't feel well rested. The snoring may or may not be present. And so really the only way, way to tell a difference between the person who might have obstructive and central sleep apnea is with a sleep test. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So um, it, it sounds like uh, the people, that there may be some 18 to 20 million people out there who don't even know they have sleep apnea, but don't you find it, uh, and we'll talk about uh, treatment options, but don't you find that the people that do ultimately get treatment are so much happier and so much better and so much less fatigued? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. You know, one of the really fun things about uh, what I do, you know, as a sleep specialist is uh, particularly for obstructive sleep apnea, which is so highly prevalent, it's really pretty straightforward to diagnose. You know, there's very good sleep tests that are widely available, and there are many options f uh, for treatment that are effective. So, you know, many people know about uh, continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP devices, but there's also oral appliances. Uh, here at Mayo Clinic, we also have implantable devices that will actually stiffen the tongue muscles during sleep that are, are good for some people. Implantable devices. Yes. Tell us about so, that. We, so, so there is a device that uh, actually is put in just like a pacemaker for obstructive sleep apnea, and that pacemaker basically paces the tongue muscle. So as the patient starts taking a breath, it stiffens those muscles in the back of the throat and can actually uh, treat obstructive sleep apnea. It's called, uh, the brand name for it is the Inspire system. And this has been around now for several years, uh, and we've been you know, having some success with this. There's only certain patients with obstructive sleep apnea that are good candidates for that, but that can be uh, another option for effective treatment. And there's also surgeries on the upper airway to make more room and so forth. For central sleep apnea, We've had more of a challenge there until just lately. So this is actually a good time to be somebody who has central sleep apnea. Uh, All right, but you know, but before we talk yeah. about that, let's let's talk a little bit more about risk factors because we know that there are more men than women uh, sleep uh, and causes. I mean, you, we're talking about an obstruction of the airway. What causes an obstruction of the airway? Yeah. Well, so I mentioned, you know, it tends to be more prevalent as we get older. You can't do too much about that. That's just uh, uh, probably has to do with the control of our musculature. But in particular, weight and the distribution of weight seems to be a big uh, factor. So as people uh, put on more weight, and you can kind of see this uh, most dramatically maybe in a neck circumference measurement. Neck circumference, as it starts getting more than 16 centimeters, so like if you're a, a guy or a gal out there that has a neck circumference that's bigger than 16 inches or 15 inches when you buy your shirts, that's going to be putting you at higher risk for having obstructive sleep apnea. Now, why some individuals um, develop obstructive sleep apnea and another similarly shaped, similar gender, similar age person doesn't have it is more complicated, and it really has to do with neurologic control and musculoskeletal facial features. It can run in families. So if you have a family member who has obstructive sleep apnea, you're more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea yourself. In the intro, we talked a little bit about children and babies. What what kind of sleep apnea do those, does that population have? Yeah. So in, in the very young children, you know, most often uh, we're seeing that they'll have obstructive sleep apnea either because of their facial uh, anatomy that just uh, creates a, a scaffolding for a smaller airway, or oftentimes they'll have significantly large tonsils and adenoids mm -hmm. that obstruct the airway. So actually, you know, for younger children, 
sometimes a surgical treatment is good, but, but we use the same kind of treatments on, on children as we do on adults, where you can use CPAP and oral appliances and all those things as well. Un- unfortunately, as, as many will be aware, there is an obesity epidemic in the uh, United States and, and, and all of the world, and so we're actually seeing more children who are becoming obese and developing very similar sleep apnea as adults. Really? So, now yeah. that's discouraging. Yeah, it is. It All right, is. you know, when we, the risk factors, let's go over those once more because there's actually a mnemonic for that, P-Bang. Um, <laughs> and you talked about uh, body mass index or being uh, obese. People that are age is one of the risk yep. factors, being older. Neck circumference greater than 16 inches. Gender being male. And then the other one that was on this list is uh, blood pressure. If you have increased blood pressure, yes. you're more likely to have right. sleep apnea. So actually maybe a better uh, kind of phrase to remember is stop bang. Stop bang. And so it's okay. it's the snoring, tired, obstruction. So people are watching you have these choking or uh, obstruction episodes. Uh, and then the blood pressure is the P. So uh, having elevated blood pressure is a risk factor for sleep apnea. It's probably an association. It's hard to tell which is the chicken and the egg. Probably the obstructive sleep apnea causes the high blood pressure. And then the body mass index is the B. So uh, there's a way you can you can go online and calculate your body mass index by putting in your height and weight. Yep. And if that comes out greater than 35, it, you're, you're, you're pretty heavy. And then the uh, age over 50 and neck circumference we've already talked about and then the gender being male so that's the stop bang stop bang yeah if, all right S- sleep apnea with sleep expert dr timothy morgenthaler it's time for a short break when we come back we'll talk about the diagnosis of sleep apnea and being in the sleep center and we'll also talk about treatment options for the most common type obstructive sleep apnea and also a new device to treat central sleep apnea Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is sleep expert, Dr. Timothy Morgenthaler. We're talking about sleep apnea, both types, obstructive and central. And isn't there a complex type also where you have both? That's absolutely true. So years ago, we started seeing a, a pattern of some people who start out looking for all the world like they have obstructive sleep apnea. And when we relieve that obstruction and open their airway, lo and behold, they have central sleep they apnea behind it. that so <laughs> so it really represented a new treatment challenge you know how are we going to uh really treat these individuals uh, well, how do you diagnose it yeah so a sleep study is really necessary to diagnose any kind of sleep apnea um we we you know we do have two kinds of sleep studies uh, for people who are really looking like they're going to have obstructive sleep apnea very often we can use a home sleep apnea test Um, And so this is a device that somebody would use in their own home, in their own bed, or in a hotel room or whatever. And uh, this can very often, you know, be adequate to provide a a diagnosis for obstructive sleep apnea. Is it like a machine? Um, There's there's several different kinds of devices. There are two that we're using very commonly. One uh, actually kind of fastens onto the wrist and the finger and has a little probe that goes onto the chest. It's quite easy to apply and uh, it works very well. And then there's another that has some little bands that go around the chest and the abdomen and some, some uh, sensors to, to measure flow up at the, uh, at the nose and mouth. So these are both devices that you know, a, a person can, can affix to themselves at home and, and then we can have those results and review those. And because 80% of the people who have it are not being treated, is that covered by insurance? Both the home sleep apnea tests and the in-lab sleep tests are covered by insurance. Uh, not surprisingly, there might be a preference to try the home sure. tests. We, we don't do the home tests when we are concerned that they might have central sleep apnea. So, And, and why is that? Well, the, the home tests have really been designed and validated to d- diagnose obstructive kinds of sleep apnea. So it's not uncommon for a person to maybe need an in-lab study. So that's a, you come to the sleep center. Now let me ask you, it, should any male who snores and is over the age of 50 have a sleep test? I think they should at least talk to their physician and put together whether they have a high likelihood of having obstructive sleep apnea. I'm, more and more I'm seeing my waiting room in my office sort of populated by people who are sent from their doctors, their cardiologists, their neurologists, their internists, that uh, this person has high blood pressure, they have heart disease, they have uh, 
you know, poor sleep quality and things like that. And we really can then deal with those individuals very quickly to diagnose them. And as I mentioned, very often we have great treatments for them that uh, are effective and improve their quality of life. They sleep better. They, you know, many of these uh, risk factors uh, kind of erode as we treat their sleep apnea. I was going to say even more than men over 40, should anyone who snores mention it to their doctor? Well, yeah, I think I think that's a good idea. And I, and I do want to uh, just make one little uh, pitch here. Um, very often people think of obstructive sleep apnea as a male disease. That really is not true. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it really is not true. See? You know, the prevalence in women uh, does begin to rise uh, in the 40s. And as women uh, go into their 50s and 60s, actually there's not a lot of difference in the prevalence of sleep apnea between men and women. You know, what, what actually happens is that women's sleep complaints are perhaps just a bit different from those of the men. Um, sometimes men are less... Uh, willing to mention that their wife snores, um, and so there, there's just a different presentation. But you know, really, if you are uh, anyone who is having troubles with snoring, poor quality sleep, excessive sleepiness, there's an explanation for this that should be sought. All right, we've got a couple of minutes remaining. Let's talk about treatment. First of all, the most common type of obstructive sleep apnea, you've got good treatments for that. Yes. And yes. always have. And is that the, the CPAP? Well, you know, so we've got a variety of things. CPAP, you know, has been around since the 70s, and it's been, uh, you know, improved upon. So they're smaller, lighter, quieter, more comfortable. They do all kinds of things. So that forces and the airway to stay open. It, it, it supports the airway, prevents it from collapsing. That's okay. right. Continuous positive airway pressure. Correct. Is that what it stands for? Okay. Exactly. And then we have oral appliances that can be fit by dentists who are qualified and, and interested in this type of treatment. And this basically is an is a, uh, oral device, almost like a retainer that one puts in at bedtime. And this holds the jaw into a position that can, in many cases, hold the, the uh, back of the throat open enough for a person to breathe and sleep well at night. There are surgical procedures that alter the configuration of the of the upper airway, either by you know re remodeling the jawline or by removing some of the tissue inside the back of the throat. And then I mentioned that we have an implantable device for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and then there's central sleep apnea. All right, let's yeah. get to that, yeah, because you've got yeah. a new uh, device to treat that. Yes, yeah, so for central sleep apnea, you know, one of the problems has been, um, again, closure of the airway isn't the big problem. So treating patients with central sleep apnea with a CPAP device, which is intended to hold open the airway, rarely has Doesn't the effectiveness the to solve no. the problem. The brain is still not sending the signal to breathe. So um, some individuals we can treat with a breathing machine that actually sort of reminds them to breathe over and over again. Again, we call that an adaptive servo ventilator. It has a strange name, but it's basically a machine that both holds the airway open and nudges the patient to take breaths uh, to get them into a more normal rhythm. But for patients with advanced heart failure, um, studies actually showed that maybe using the second kind of device isn't so good for them. There, there's some debate and, and concern about using um, non-invasive ventilation devices. So we've been kind of stuck for those patients for a while. And just recently, there's a device that's been FDA approved. It's also an implantable device. It's implanted by a cardiologist like a pacemaker, but instead of pacing the heart to pump regularly, it actually paces the diaphragm so it's a device that's put in, it's behind the skin, and when it's time to go to bed and the patient lies down, the device turns on and it begins to take over the breathing uh, pulse for them. It, you know, it, it goes ahead and paces their diaphragm so that they don't have those lapses in breath. It's been shown to be quite effective um, in, the, in the early studies. Um, you know, what's really happened is, uh, on average, the frequency of these breathing events, uh, pauses, goes down by 90, 80, you know, 80, 90 percent, and it's, that is, effectiveness is over uh, now a year or even up to three years it's been shown. And, and what's really interesting, you know, so, so decreasing the number of, of bad breaths, if you will, makes doctors feel good, but what I'm very compelled by is that the patients, when they've talked to the patients who've had these devices placed, 95 percent of them actually say that they would do it again. So that's pretty good. And it requires a little operation to put this uh, implant in the chest wall. It's huh? an outside, it's an outpatient procedure, just like a pacemaker is. Uh, so the patient typically doesn't spend a night in, in the hospital, or if they do, it's just one night of observation. Um, but it's it, it's uh, well tolerated, and it, uh, we're excited to have, be able to offer that treatment to patients now. Absolutely, we because you haven't anything had before. anything before. Right, so it's, it's, it's called, uh, you know, a transvenous phrenic pacing. 
So uh, it's the nerve, the phrenic nerve the that phrenic controls nerve. the diaphragm. Exactly. Perfect. Dr. Timothy Morgenthaler is a sleep expert. Sleep apnea is a common problem with potential serious health consequences. A lot of people who don't know they have it. There are multiple effective treatments for the most common form of sleep apnea called obstructive sleep apnea. And now there is a new effective treatment for the less common form of sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and it's an implantable phrenic nerve stimulator. Dr. Timothy Morgenthaler, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me.